Well, good morning. Let me invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the sermon text this morning, which comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Uh, This morning, we have a wonderful opportunity, as we have been continuing through the Gospel of Matthew, to continue doing something that's very important to the life of our church and something that's very important to each of our individual lives as Christians. And that really is the continued development of our worldview, the way that we see God, the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see the world is of immeasurable importance. It directs everything about the way that we live, the way that we talk, the way that we think and feel about the world, and the way that we respond to God. And so it's a good reminder to us this morning, because as we, take, uh, as we come to this text, we're reminded that over recent weeks, we have been noticing that there are some texts of Scripture like this that are pretty familiar to us. And sometimes they can be kind of resigned to this corner of our minds of texts that we we think about, accounts in the Bible, stories, sometimes we call them, that are in a certain corner of our memory and they don't get much attention because they seem like things we just read at certain times of the year or maybe they're just good stories to know about. But really, instead, what we want to see again this morning is that every text of Scripture, including those that are really familiar to us, have another purpose than just reminding us of something that happened in the past or or knowing a certain chapter of redemptive, redemptive history, but instead to understand what it says to us in our daily lives. That's something we're always trying to do. Uh, Some weeks we do that better than others, but we're always trying to understand what the Bible has to say to us in the day-in, day-out, nitty-gritty of life. And that certainly is true this morning as well as we look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. I want to teach you as we begin uh, kind of a fancy word. It's a German word, and uh, I don't share these things to make myself sound smart because I don't even know that I'm pronouncing it correctly. When I pronounce it as Weltanschwang, Weltanschwang is a German word that I learned from one of my favorite theologians, Hermann Bavink, who was a Dutch theologian, and it's a word that means life and worldview. It's an important word because it, again, captures the very important topic or or concept of how we see the world, that we need to craft over and over again and refine our life and worldview the way that we see the world, but the way also that we see our lives. Coming to this text, we find that the incarnation of Jesus, his entrance into our world, is marked by three big things. Not only three things, but in this text, three big things. And these three big things say a lot about the way that we as Christians see our lives. And the more clearly that we can see them, the more effective we can be, the more useful we can be, the more comforted we can be by what we know of God in his word, and I hope that that will be true for us this morning. The first big thing that marks the incarnation of Jesus is coming into the world, as we see it this morning in this text, is that Jesus came into the world with a promise of divine protection. A promise of divine protection. Read along in your hearts as I read aloud verses 13 through 15, and then we'll consider this promise of divine protection and what it says about Jesus and, in turn, what it says to us in our lives. Verse 13 begins this way. After they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death, so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, the first thing that we see here in this promise of divine protection is that Jesus himself came into the world with an undefeatable force of security. This is one of the amazing truths that we see, not only reflected here, but in many other texts of Scripture, 
that tell us just the, the incredible power that Jesus had and the incredible protection that brought him into the world. There was literally nothing that could have happened in the life and ministry of Jesus on earth that would have prevented him from accomplishing his mission. Nothing. He had absolute perfect protection. No one could kill him. No one could slow him down. No one could stop him. It was an impossibility. We see this divine protection here in verse 13 because there's a supernatural work happening, uh, orchestrating the details of their lives and moving the family around uh, to keep them protected. We see that in verse 13, after they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Again, as we've said recently, anytime you read something like that, you need to stop and think about that. This is not an ordinary thing. This doesn't happen every day. This is a unique situation in which God is working to protect the Savior of the world through miraculous means. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, get up, take his, the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. This is just one of the, of the little pictures of the protection that Jesus enjoyed coming into the world, that no one and nothing could thwart his plan. You know, it's a timely thing to think about this, given the recent frightening events in our U.S. political climate, of something that's not unprecedented, but incredibly rare to have an assassination attempt on a political figure in our country. We have, as we heard on the news over and over again, the most highly trained security force in the world. And yet, sometimes danger slips through. Sometimes tragedy threatens to foil that protective effort. But with Jesus, when he comes to earth, he comes with an absolutely unmatched security. There is nothing that can happen to thwart his plans. No one will slip through the outer or inner ring of his protection. This is an important truth for us because it says a lot about our Christian lives. It doesn't just say something about Jesus. It says something about his work in our lives to understand this incredible aspect of his nature. What I'd like to do is just take a moment and let's think about this For a few minutes here, what is Jesus' protection like? We could think about it in at least five categories. Here's number one. Jesus comes into the world with an unmatched security force because he himself has divine authority. That's number one. If you're taking notes, these are good little sub points that you can come back to later this week in your own personal devotional time or or discuss in community group as you work through community group questions But what we know of Jesus in the Bible is that Jesus possessed absolute authority. We've seen that in some incredible ways in the Gospels over natural and supernatural forces and beings. He could command the elements. He could calm storms on the Sea of Galilee. He had power over demonic forces. There was nothing natural or supernatural that could keep Jesus from accomplishing his mission to save his people from their sins. Number two, he had divine protection from harm. He was shielded from physical harm until the appointed time of his sacrifice. And we see that most clearly in a time here when Jesus is young in his earthly life, in a time when he would appear to be very vulnerable and yet he has divine protection from harm. Even later in his life, we see it come up over and over again on several occasions when people sought to harm Jesus prematurely, jumping the gun for when he actually would give his life as a ransom for sin, he evaded their grasp. We've seen cases in the Gospels where a crowd is pressing in on Jesus in order to capture him and have their way with him, and yet somehow, because of the divine protection of his life, he just slips away. No one and nothing could keep him 
from his ultimate plan to redeem his people from their sins. In addition to that, we see a kind of spiritual protection in that Jesus had in himself an inherent holiness. Jesus, unlike us, had a sinless nature. And therefore, we see playing out in his life every moment of every day a perfect obedience to God's will. And of course, that perfect obedience places him at the very center of this supernatural safeguard and protection. His righteousness, his purity are intrinsic to his being. Yet another one of those truths that ought to give us comfort, that we follow a king who is not prone to mishaps, who is not prone to slip-ups or failures or sin, but is absolutely perfect. He cannot, he cannot be tempted into sin, though he was tempted in every way as we are, yet he was without sin. Number four, we see throughout the Gospels that Jesus has a spiritual insight and wisdom unknown anywhere else in the universe. He has profound spiritual discernment and wisdom. This profound spiritual discernment and wisdom enables him to navigate all of these dangerous situations that we see playing out in his life and to do so with clarity and with authority. He often outwitted his opponents in debates and challenges He preserved himself from their traps by his insight and wisdom, his perfect knowledge of all things. Again, there's another truth that needs to come out of this topic of Jesus' protection and his invincibility for our daily lives. How would you feel if the Bible taught that Jesus was your king And yet he wasn't very insightful. He didn't always know what the right thing to do was. He didn't always know who was plotting against him or from what angle the next danger was coming. Well, you would have no comfort in that. It almost wouldn't matter that he was your savior because it would be all left to chance. But that's not the kind of savior that we have. So even here, as we look at these words in Matthew chapter 2, it is another reminder, a small spark of of light that, that reminds us that Jesus is the ultimate Savior. And then, of course, as we've already noticed in the Gospel of Matthew, and we continue, uh, we will continue to do so, he is protected, in a sense, by the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus was protected by the prophecies that had been made about him to ensure that he carried out his mission exactly the way God the Father had ordained it, to the glory of God the Father and to the completion of his mission. All of these truths amount to a a reminder to us of who is the king that we serve. Who is this Jesus who is our Savior And what is he like in our daily lives? Because all of these things that were true in the Gospel of Matthew, all of these things are true today. But all of these truths are also truths that are quickly leave my grasp. They escape my mind. They probably do for you as well in moments of high stress and uncertainty, moments when things don't They don't appear to be under control. I can't seem to figure out why this or that happened. I can't foresee how this or that will will come to fruition. I cannot imagine how this problem or heartache or sorrow or conflict is ever going to work for good. I know that God works at all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, but I just can't see that. I need truths like these to flood my heart and mind in those moments and remind me of who exactly is the king who has come to save me, to redeem me, to keep me, and will care for me forevermore. But I want you to see one other thing before we leave this first mark of Jesus' entrance into the world this morning. I want you to notice that the protection that he enjoyed in verses 13 through 15 happened in a really strange, if you think about it, kind of unpredictable way. This is not the way that I would imagine it happening. 
and that is in the context of daily life. You know that there are so many other ways that God could have protected Jesus from Herod, who's just a man. There are so many other ways that he could have done it. But the way that he does it here is not to simply impose his will up above the circumstances of Jesus and his earthly family, but he does it in the midst of the circumstances of his earthly family. He does it by having them actually move from one place to another. He does it by delivering messages through, in this case, the unique and miraculous way of using a dream through an angel to do it in the midst of circumstances on a night of the week. This, I think, is an important truth for me. Maybe it's an important truth for you. That while all of this is true, that God is in absolute ordaining control over all the details of my life, he has chosen in his wisdom not to reign and rule my life from outer space, but to do it on the level of my life. He does it eye to eye with me. He, like we do with little children, has stooped down. Of course, that's what happens when Jesus comes into the world. But even then, all of the protective power, all of the ordaining influence is happening on the street level of my life. It's as if God the Father here and in my life and yours has stooped down and chosen to work all of his glorious, heavenly unmatched power and protection down into the details of my life. That means that I am going to feel some tension, which I alluded to a moment ago. Because in the midst of all of that, I still have those circumstances. I still have those potential fears and worries. I have those things going on, the conflicts and the tensions, the losses, the crosses. I have all of these things going on, and that's where he's working his protection. It's requiring of us a kind of faith and trust that only he can give us by grace. Of course, it would be much easier in a sense If God would just sit in heaven and snap his fingers over my life and all of the things I'm concerned about just disappeared like balloons popping in the sky, they were just gone. And all of a sudden it was clear and the sun's shining. That seems like that would be pretty easy. But that's not the way that he has ordained things to work in our lives. He's delivering his protection in the context of circumstances which is calling upon me by his grace to trust him in the midst of this. This is the challenge of the Christian life. This is the challenge that you have faced this week. You have had a myriad of different experiences and circumstances that have raised and lowered the temperature of your life, that have increased and decreased the suffering and discomfort of your life, And in the midst of all of that, God has been working through the details to lead you to trust him and the protection that he has for you, even when it is difficult to see. So the first way that we could apply this truth and first part of this text to our lives would be this. In order for us to be faithful to God by his grace in the midst of these circumstances, we need to keep the reminders of God's perfect plans worked out in everyday life. We need these kinds of truths that we've just looked at and we've considered here in the way that even this works out in the earthly life of Jesus in his earthly ministry. We need those reminders that even when my circumstances are confusing me, even when the sorrow and heartache of this life are tempting me to question whether I actually am under God's protective control as one of his elect, I need the reminder again to put me at ease. That it doesn't matter how my circumstances look, it does not change the fact that my king has divine authority. 
that my king has the ability and the intention to protect me from harm according to his will. And of course, we know that does not mean that I am going to lead um, a life of successive green lights and no hardship and no suffering. But rather, in the midst of that, he will protect me. That he has an inherent holiness that I can depend upon. He is inherently faithful to me. He has the spiritual insight and wisdom to know exactly what to do when, and he has already planned from eternity past to do those very things. This is going to be our life from here on, constantly trying to grab after those truths when our lives say it's out of control. He's not around. He cannot help you. He's, he's asleep. He's forgotten. You've done something to offend him. No. I need these truths to remind me over and over again. The second mark of Jesus' entrance into the world to be the re, uh, redeemer of his people is a shocking one. And it is that we see not only a promise of divine protection working out in his life, even in those earliest days, But even in the earliest days, we see an incitement of incredible suffering in the world. That his entrance into the world did not end suffering. It's not as though the world is, the suffering in the world or evil in the world is somehow allergic to him and they repel and they run away. And so the suffering of the world is only 300 miles away from him at all times. The suffering of the world is inflamed by his presence in the world. It's one of those things that marks the difference between Jesus and the world. They're at enmity with each other, they don't get along, they don't mix. And when he comes in to the world, all of a sudden, there is yet something we would not expect, this incitement of incredible suffering. Listen to these words. You know this well. This is one of our favorite stories. Christmas time, to think about Jesus coming into the world and the incredible opposition that he faced. But hear it again in verses 16 through 18. Then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet was fulfilled. These words, verse 18, a voice was heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. What we see here quickly in the account is at least one aspect of the key reason that Jesus came into the world, and that is the horrible suffering and offense of sin. This is not the way that the world should be. These kinds of things ought not happen, but they do. Since the fall, the world has not been what it was, and it has not been what it one day will be. You remember this because there are key characters that stand out in your memory, like Herod the Great. He was appointed, if you remember, by the Roman Senate as a kind of king of the Jews in 40 BCE. He was ruling Judea and Samaria and Galilee, but he was known for his cunning political maneuvers and his ruthless tactics to maintain his power. So, it makes sense, when faced with the prospect of another king which he learned about from the wise men, right? He viewed them as kind of like astrologers to tell him what was going to happen. He was threatened, and therefore he clung to his power. But he did not know who exactly he was going up against. So they were warned not to go to Herod, 
in order to protect Jesus. We've seen that. And Herod was enraged with jealousy. And then we see this horrible, horrible result to his ruling desire to maintain his power. The massacre, that's a key word, the massacre of all the boys in and around that area who were two years old and under. We know from the Bible and we know from our lives that life in this fallen world is a mixture of joys and sorrows. There can be very high joys because of God's ultimate grace and blessing in the world, because of the way that he's restrained sin, the way that he continues to work to delight his people with his presence, and and he gives us many gifts that we can use to glorify him and to enjoy those things. We know that the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him, There's no higher joy in the world than glorifying God. That is the enjoyment of God, is to glorify him. And yet, we also know that in this world, horrible things do happen. We know that this world can have the very highest of sorrows as well. And we certainly see that here. We do not have to imagine anything like this happening because we know it happens in our country all the time. You, you, you really cannot look at this text and to see what's happening to these children and not immediately think of the blight of abortion in our country and in our world, despite all of the efforts that have been made to prevent it, even trying to, to have a, a sanctity of human life Sunday, which was designated 40 years ago on January 22nd by then-President Ronald Reagan, to try to highlight the sanctity of human life in a fallen world, to, to curb these evils in the world. And yet, even today, this is surprising to me, 62% of U.S. adults said that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. 62%. In 2020, it was estimated that 930,000 souls were lost due to abortion in the U.S. Now, in Herod's case, it's hard to know how many children lost their lives. Somewhere between 20 and maybe all the way to 14,000. But you know, it doesn't really matter how many. I mean, how many, how many have to happen in order for it to be a, a, you know, a noteworthy story or a problem that attracts attention It does not have to be many. Instead, it's a reminder of the fallenness of our world, of the highs and the lows. And texts like this are helpful to us when we see the promise of divine protection that Jesus brings into the world while also seeing it in light of the suffering of the world that we need to be able to hold the joys and the sorrows in tension through the work of Jesus in our lives. This is the reality for all of us. I bought these shoes because I needed them for my first daughter's wedding. Five days later, I wore these shoes to a funeral visitation for a precious two-year-old boy named Clayton who lost his life. This world is full of joys and it is full of sorrows. And we need God's grace to help us. One of the things that we need, though, is to come to terms with the misery of the world, to be willing to call that what it is, to be able to call the suffering and acknowledge the suffering of our world so that we can, that we can pursue our ultimate hope in Christ. You read these words about suffering and heartache in verse 18, a voice was heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. This is a fulfillment of what Jeremiah records about Rachel, the wife of Jacob, weeping over the exile and suffering of God's people at that time. And so Matthew pulls that account from Jeremiah to highlight the extreme suffering and misery. And again, to highlight for us the kind of world that Jesus is coming into 
and the incredible redemptive work that Jesus intends to do to overcome that world. We cannot rightly estimate the incredible power and accomplishment of Jesus in the gospel in the world without rightly estimating the mountain of suffering and sin that this world knows. You can't do it. You will not appreciate Jesus and his power and what he's accomplished for us in this world without getting a grip on the misery that brought him here. One of the ways that we can do this, and we'll do it this morning just briefly, I want to share a few questions that come up in a catechism called the Heidelberg Catechism. If you know anything about the Paramount Church Catechism, it's based on the Heidelberg Catechism. But I want to share just a few questions and answers that highlight for us in a striking way the reality of the misery of the world and the importance of recognizing your need for Christ in order for you to come to him and then to enjoy him and walk with him. Listen to this. Here's question two from this catechism. What do you need to know to find true comfort in life and in death? The answer says three things. First, how great my sins and miseries are. That's interesting. That's first. You cannot appreciate the comfort of the gospel without recognizing how great are your sins and miseries. We live in a miserable world. Yes, there are many high joys. This is a miserable world under the curse of sin. It is nothing like the world to come for that reason. So first, you must know how great are your sins and miseries. Second, how you can be rescued from all your sins and miseries. That's the good news of the gospel. That's what we're reading about here in Matthew 2, the entrance of the Savior of the world into this kind of a world in order to redeem us from this world and its sinful curse. Then, third, how to show gratitude to God for such rescue. You see, there's another piece on the end there that we must have, is to know how then do I live my life in gratitude to the God who has done this for me? We must have those three things. Question three of the catechism, but how do you know about your misery? Well, you know about your misery from God's law. God's law is simply the the voice of Scripture that declares to us all of God's righteous expectations. It tells us what he is like, what is his character and nature, what what are his attributes. Because when we look into the mirror of the law, when we point the mirror of the law at the world and get a glance of what it really is like, the law of God shows us just how miserable our sinful world is, and how desperately we need God to show us grace. Or question nine from the catechism. Isn't it unfair of God to require from us in his law what we can't do? It says, not at all. God created us capable of obeying him, but because of the devil's influence and our own deliberate disobedience, we've deprived ourselves and all our descendants of God's gifts. This is such a statement of the misery of this world, of life in this world. And then finally, question 10. Will God overlook such disobedience and rebellion? Absolutely not. Will God overlook the rebellion and disobedience of Herod in Matthew chapter 2, in the death of these children in an effort to snuff out the Son of God coming to save the world? Absolutely not. God is deeply displeased with our original sin as well as our actual sins. He will punish them justly both now and in eternity as he has declared. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So what is our answer to that? Obey. Is that our answer? Obey. Make sure you get with the program. Do the law. Actually, our answer is quite different. Our answer is come to Christ. Because Christ is the one who came into our world in the midst of this so that he may be our savior. Second application of this text would simply be this. We must, we must allow the miseries of this life in a fallen world to direct us to Christ. We must, we cannot simply keep wishing away 
All of the things that we don't like about this world are the sorrows that we face. We must embrace them, and by grace we can, so that they will lead us to look to Christ as our ultimate hope, to stop looking to other hopes that are temporary and bankrupt, counterfeit hopes. Finally, this morning in the time that we have left, I want you to see a final mark of Jesus' entrance into our world. He came not only with a promise of divine protection, he came not only into the midst of an incitement of incredible suffering because of his presence, but he also came into our world with a careful plan of rescue, which is, which is shadowed even in the circumstances that God the Father works out in the details of Jesus' earth, uh, early life. Listen to verses 19 through 23, and then we'll come to a close. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, because those who intended to kill the child are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and entered the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the region of Galilee. Then he went and settled in a town called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Even here in these circumstances, God's sovereign plan continues to work itself out in the daily lives. Jesus and Mary and Joseph and many other people, and that continues to happen today to every person who knows Christ in this room. Now, it's interesting, we don't really know how much time has elapsed between 18 and 19, those two verses, because you see that they had escaped and they were off in Egypt waiting for those who would kill Jesus to have died and to be stopped, and now suddenly it's time, Herod has died. We don't know exactly how long it was, but we do know here now that safety is available, and so God again meticulously, personally, directs them to Nazareth where they will settle. Now, as we uh, spend our last few moments this morning looking at this text, I want to show you one other thing that I think is helpful to us. It's helpful to me as I try to keep the entire redemptive plan that God has, has worked out across the pages of Scripture together. And one way that we do that is something uh, called typology. It simply means that when we see Jesus and his life playing out in the Gospels, there are often other figures that God had placed in the timeline of redemptive history that kept pointing forward to the, the true and better. Jesus is always the true and better. You might think of this typology as um, kind of like the main theme of your maybe favorite movie. A few of us watched La La Land the other night and enjoyed listening to the score of the movie and hearing that main theme keep popping up over and over again. It's a little bit like that in the redemptive history of God's people. And we see one here that I want to show you because there is a kind of typology actually looking all the way back in the Old Testament to Moses in relation to Jesus. And what it helps us to do is we are able to study our Bibles well and notice some of these things is to give us more and more reason to build our confidence in God's meticulous plan to keep us, to save us forevermore. I want you to notice this first, that there is an infant deliverance in both stories. Think about what you know of Moses and what you know of Jesus. They both line up with the same quality about them. There's an infant deliverance. You remember that Moses was saved from Pharaoh's decree to kill all Hebrew male infants by being placed in a basket in the Nile River where he was then, you know, found and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Do you see how that lines up here? We're seeing God working out to his own glory these tracks or plot lines of the redemptive story so that they come together to the ultimate fruition in what Jesus has done. Here, Jesus was spared from Herod's decree to kill all the male infants in Bethlehem and around by Joseph and Mary fleeing to Egypt with him. You think back about Moses' life, there's also a return from Egypt. After some years in exile, Moses returned from Egypt to deliver the Israelites from slavery. 
Here we see the same thing again. After Herod's death, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus returned from Egypt to Israel. We notice in the life and work of Moses that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. He was a deliverer and lawgiver. And Jesus, who is the greater Moses, is the ultimate deliverer who brings salvation, not just to Israel, but to all of his chosen people, who include many of us who are Gentiles. Moses was a prophet and a teacher. Jesus was a prophet and a teacher. When we notice these kinds of things in Scripture, we find them building our confidence that we are not living in just one little isolated moment in time. We are living in a moment of time that is sewn together into an incredible tapestry of this plan of redemption that God has made. Therefore, our little moment in time is far more important than we think that it is. It is part of the grand narrative, the grand story of the gospel. But we need these, don't we? If you go through your day, day in, day out, with the losses and the crosses, and in the misery of this fallen world, and you don't have some of these connections made in your heart and mind, things are going to be more difficult. It's going to be harder to, to recall in those moments why. Why do you trust Jesus? How do you know that he's dependable? How do you know that he will rescue you? How do you know that he cares for you? We need all of these threads, all of these figures, which Jesus shows that he's better than, to come together and to build up our hope day in and day out. Therefore, the last application this morning is simply to look carefully into the marvelous ways God unfolds his redemptive plan. Just like this connection between Moses and Jesus, it is an incredible miracle of orchestration as he maintains all of the themes of Scripture all the way through his redemptive plan. And therefore, when we see that and we look to Christ as the ultimate fulfillment of those promises, we know that we have a Savior that we can trust. We have protection. We live in a world of suffering. But our God has plans to save us, and he is doing it in this very moment. He's doing it as you hear these words. I want to invite you to stand as you're able so that we can pray and thank God for these truths and ask him that he would minister them to us. And it also could be that you're a guest here today or you're on the live stream and that you're not a Christian. Maybe this is the first time that you've heard about the incredible things that Jesus has done for sinners like us. Let me encourage you to seek out Christ, that you would find other helpful people to walk with you and to talk with. We would love to talk with you and to think more about what Jesus has done for us so that you might know him. Do not, do not hesitate. Do not hesitate to do that. Let's pray. Our Father, on this Sunday morning, we give you thanks because uh, you have provided us the ultimate rest in Christ. And that rest is only possible because of your divine protection in Christ, of Christ, for Christ and for us. And that even in the midst of a fallen world that is full of misery and sorrow, yet you continue to delight us with your grace. And we certainly pray that you would work again and again to remind us of your redemptive plan. Help us in the ups and the downs, in the joys and the sorrows of this life. We pray that Jesus himself, his grace by your spirit, according to your plan from eternity past to eternity future would be the linchpin of everything that we believe and everything that we are, and that you would help us to walk with you and to know you in the midst of it all. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.